What's up YouTube, this is Tube Digger. This is my first tutorial on the Pioneer DJ DJS 1000 DJ sampler. So I've got this machine on loan at the moment for about two and a half weeks and I've learned quite a bit in the last two days of actually using it. So that's a combination of me being quite quick to learn machines like this, but all in all, I think I've got up and running with it pretty quickly because it is a really nicely designed and well thought out machine. I haven't updated this machine. I believe it's on version 101. So I'm gonna press and hold this utility button and that will give me access to all the back end settings, okay? So let's have a look down here. So there you go, version 1.01. .01. So I'm going to update the firmware and we're gonna get that up to the latest revision, which is 1.0.3. So from what I can see on Pioneer DJ's website, version 1.0.3 update, there's a fix. It says potential freeze when repeating manual live sampling with the beat length selected in record length when beat sync is enabled. Now I've not got round to recording anything into this machine or sampling into this machine as yet. So I've not experienced that. It also says improved the launching process when turning on the power. So as soon as I update the machine, then I'll be able to see how long the boot up process takes in comparison to what it is currently. So whilst I'm here, I need to use my USB stick, which is just up here on the top left. I'm gonna press and hold the USB stop button, which is just underneath. It's just off screen, I'm afraid. But that will flash and then it will stop and then it's safe to eject the USB stick. So it's really simple. You just download the firmware, so I'll put a link in the description. And then you just copy that to the root directory of your USB stick and then you're all good to go. So I've copied the firmware 1.0.3 update to my USB stick. So you have to put the DJS 1000 into update mode without putting your USB stick inside the machine. So you first of all need to power it off and then press and hold the sampling and effects buttons and switch the machine on. Okay, and then you get this message saying connect USB storage device into USB slot or top USB slot. So I'm gonna do that. As we can see at the top, it's showing the current version and the version that it's going to update to. And there we go, firmware update is complete. Turn off the power before using. So I'm gonna turn that off now. Now it says in the firmware update guide to remove the USB stick before powering on, just for safety in case it corrupts your USB stick, I'll assume. So let's switch it back on. We got the message to say it's all correct, so it should be fine. Now let's see if the boot process is quicker. I can't really tell yet, it does seem a little bit quicker. Marginally quicker. Cool, so that's all good. Let's now press and hold the utility or home button. Let's go down. And there you go, we're on version 1.0.3. So I just wanted to make sure that was done and also to show anyone who was interested to know how to update, that's how you do it. So I'm gonna put my memory stick back in. And there you go. So I've already created a few projects on here. If we press project, then you get the options to create a new project. Now we don't need to do that because it's already booted up into a blank project. We can open a project. So we can scroll down with this data wheel, click it. You can choose uh, the USB, which is my USB stick, which would show us my projects that I've already saved anyway. Let's press back to get back out of there. Or we can scroll down and select the 
most recent project that I've used, which is that same project that we just saw in there. Or we can choose one of the internal projects. Now I've not saved an internal project to the internal drive. I'm not sure if you can. I don't think you can from memory. It just gives you the option to save to your USB device. So let's go back out of that. Now I'm not going to create a new project because we're already working within a blank project. So I'm going to press the home button and there you go. So anytime you want to return to your home page, you just press this home button up here. So these correspond to all your 16 pads. Now to load a sample in, we need to click on the first pad there or any of the pads. I'm going to choose my first pad and we need to click on browse. So I'm going to choose one of my own samples. Now, some of the samples in here are great. They're Loop Master samples. Uh, there's some really nice samples in there that I found, but I always prefer to use my own samples and then use these as a backup to kind of give my compositions a bit more weight. If there's a nice fat kick drum in there that I can use, I'll use it, but I won't generally use any obvious samples which other people might end up using. So I'm just going to scroll down to my USB, click on that. Now, if we want to preview these samples, we can have this selected, preview setting. As you can see, there's a white line that shows us that it's going to give us a preview of those samples. So now if I scroll down to any one of these samples, we should be able to hear it. Okay, so this is good. This shows us that this sample is probably at 48 kilohertz in this folder of samples that I've just dumped onto my USB stick, I didn't check to see what the actual sample rate is, but the DJS 1000 can only work currently with 44.1 kilohertz samples. So that sample there is obviously 48. Okay, so I'm gonna load this nice bassy kick drum onto my first pad. So I'm gonna just click the data wheel and now that's loaded. So now if I want to load another sample onto another pad, I need to select that pad. If I didn't select another pad, it would just load another sample on top of that sample that we just loaded in. Now I'm going to press home, and as you can see, we've now populated those sample slots for the pads with those two samples. So I'm just going to turn down the volume of this sample. So this volume here corresponds to the actual track. So if we go to the mixer, it's corresponding with the track. So the pads and the samples that loaded onto them, the volume or rather the track and the sample are the same thing essentially. You have to think about your pads as tracks. Okay. Now, the first thing I want to mention about this is if we go across three over to here, we see velocity off. This is essentially a similar function to full level in an MPC where you would have the velocity set to off and the pads will just play back at full level or rather depending on what the actual volume is set, but they won't respond to velocity. If we now switch that to velocity on, I'm going to tap my pads lightly and increase the actual pressure. Okay, so that just does that. Just wanted to show you that now. So let's go back out to the home page. Now I'm going to show you the actual sample settings. So this shows us what the sample is. So I've not got this far yet. So I'm going to click on there. This just shows us what the track type is. I assume if you set it to MIDI and you've got a MIDI synthesizer connected, you can then trigger that MIDI synthesizer from the pads, but you would have to set it to MIDI there. This obviously corresponds to the other to rise AS1 synthesizer sequencer. Uh, through, I'm not sure what that is. I assume that's a through effects track. So you can actually affect things going through the DJS 1000, but I've not used that yet. So don't quote me on that. Um, so let's take a look at the playback. So this is where you would adjust the start and end points. Just below the knobs here, it's off screen. I've wanted to focus on the screen here, but just underneath the knobs, you've got the four buttons, mute, hot slice, slice and scale. 
Again, I've not used hot slice. Mute is pretty self-explanatory. You can mute and unmute pads, or you can solo them if you press the shift button. Um, but slice and scale are the ones that I've been using the most. So scale will let me now play these pads up the scale in the same way as on an MPC when you switch it to either 16 level mode or you've got a key group program that allows you to play the samples chromatically. So I'm gonna press scale. Okay, now when I've pressed scale, we've actually changed the view here and we can choose the scale, which is nice. And there's quite a few to choose from. So let's just choose a random one. Let's choose Aeolian. It's quite a nice scale. So anyway, that's how you would choose the different scales for your pads. You can also shift the area with this knob that will let you use notes that are outside of the actual 16 pads that can't be put on all those pads if that makes sense. So that just allows you to shift the range of available notes. If we use key shift that essentially does the same thing. These graphics here are corresponding to the pads so these ones that are greyed out won't actually trigger this sample anymore. Okay so I've only got these five pads now available because we've gone way up the scale and the same if we go down the scale it's the same thing although i've got a few more to choose from now so let's reset that back to zero so whenever you press scale or slice these correspond to the actual sample that you're on so you don't get access to trigger the other samples it will just allow you to play that currently selected sample either in scale mode or slice mode so I'm going to go back out of scale. It's gone back out of the screen, but I'm actually still in scale mode. To get out of scale mode on the pads, I need to press scale so the light goes off. And now we've returned and I can trigger all my pads now. So we're in playback. We've covered set scale. We're not going to look at set slice for this sample. Now we can reverse this sample. It's as simple as that. You just set it to reverse and now it will play and you can see it's reversed the start and end points there. Okay, grid snap will allow you to snap to certain points. Again, I'm not gonna go into that for this sample. So that's playback. Now we've got amp envelope, release. There you go. We can adjust the release time, the attack time, or we can use these knobs down here to control the envelope. So let's just take a listen to that now. Now for samples like this, I quite like them to be quite short and snappy. And the envelope on this machine I found is quite nice for that. So what I would do is reduce the hold or the decay, so to speak, all the way to zero, have the attack at zero, and then use the release to control the length of this sample. You can get it really nice and tight and snappy there. Obviously, this is quite a long, boomy kick drum. Anyway, that's what that does, the envelope. We might as well look at the trigger mode here. So if it's set to one shot, that will just play from start to finish, okay? If we set it to gate, which is the only other option we get, now we've got that envelope fully wide in terms of the hold. The hold is infinite, but as you can hear, I'm just tapping on it and it's still short and snappy. Because it's set to gate mode, I will have to hold that sample for it to play from start to finish. So I find gate is really useful as long as you've got your release fully open. And now that will just play. And I don't have to hold my finger on it. And then I would take the hold down. And then I would start adjusting the release. Okay, so that's the difference between gate and one shot. One shot will play it in its entirety and gate will actually gate that sample. Gate is pretty much the equivalent of note on in the MPC Live or MPCX or any other MPCs. Sync, I've not used that. So I'm not too sure what sync actually does in terms of the amp envelope. 
Okay, I'm afraid I can't give you any further information on that. So let's go back out of the envelope. Next along we've got the effects, so we just double tap on that and we can assign some effects. It's currently got none, so we press select effects and we've got quite a few effects here to choose from. So let's just choose the delay and then that will show you the effect settings and then you can use your knobs to adjust the actual time of that delay, the feedback, the high cut off and the actual mix ratio or the dry wet balance of that effect. So if we want to swap that effect out, we can press select effects again, or if we just want to go back out to this page, we just press back. So let's go back to the effect settings again, and all those parameters for delay, you get similar parameters for all the other effects, and you can control those with the knobs down there. You can't use the touch screen to move these. So let's go back out. So that's how you set your effects. Mixer is greyed out, I'm not too sure why. Maybe that's a feature that's going to come in a, another update. Now LFO is the thing that I'm finding pretty interesting on this machine. Now this is something I'd like to see updated. I'd like to have more than one destination for this LFO or at least maybe another LFO or multiple LFOs to control multiple destinations. Then this would be, you know, something to compete with the Octatrack maybe, something that can do glitchy kind of stuff. Now this machine, you can actually set parameter locks on it in the same way that you can do on an Octatrack. It's a lot more limited, but you can still do it. And it's really handy when using the step sequencer. But I'll get to that a bit later on. So the LFO, if we click on destination, now we can choose to select quite a few different destinations. So we can choose in the playback menu, we can affect the pitch. We can affect the start of that sample, which is pretty interesting the loop start and the overall length of that sample. We can also choose the amp envelope velocity, attack, hold, release, and then all the effects and all their parameters can be affected with the LFO, which can give you some really cool results. MIDI note, I've not touched the MIDI in this at the moment, but as you can see, there's a number of MIDI options there, parameters, MIDI CC2, uh, and mixer volume. So that mixer volume and pan applies to the sample that we're currently looking at, which is on our first pad, this kick drum. So that's the destination. So let's actually choose the pitch. That's something that you can hear immediately. Okay, so our shape is a sine wave. We can change the shape to a triangle. So you don't hear it once you hover over it, you have to actually select it. It would be good if it actually previewed that whilst you went through so you could, you know, actually choose the shape you wanted without having to, you know, select it and go back out. But look, you have to select it and then it goes back out to the screen. So that's really nice for snappy, punchy drums, the saw. Okay, square. Now you're not really gonna hear square unless I increase the speed or the rate of the LFO. Now it's a bit weird on this machine because the lower values that you choose actually increase the speed. As you can see, as I'm going up, it's getting slower. You can also press the sync here and you'll notice this will change to a sync rate. So this is half notes, whole notes, two beats, three beats, four beats, eight beats, 12, 16, 32, 48. So that's that, that's the shape and the sync and the speed setting will set the different modes of how that LFO is triggered. So you can set it to trigger, which would just respond to when you press it on the pad. You can also click on that and it will shift to this side and then you can choose whether it's triggered, free running or sample and hold, which is essentially a random wave shape. So if I choose that, any time that I now trigger that LFO, it's going to play back at a random position. Even though the, the shape is a square, this is affecting the actual triggering 
hope that makes sense. Let's go back to setting. Trigger on, I'm gonna assume that the LFO will be triggered in full mode, or you can have it for both full and half, depending on whether your pad is set to be triggered at half its level. So I think I've got that correct, but you know, I'm just running through these. I've only had this machine two or three days, so some of these functions that I don't know, I'm making educated guesses on. So that's all that, destination, shape, setting, and sync. Phase will just shift the position of that LFO wave shape, whatever shape it is, you get access to that. So that's triggering from the same position, but now we can shift the phase. And it will give you a different texture as you shift through the phase of that LFO. So that's LFOs, let's go back out. Now at the top here, we can browse for another sample and load a completely new sample in. We can also choose sample edit, and this is where you would actually destructively edit this sample, and you can either overwrite it or save as a new sample. Record, I assume that's recording a new sample onto this track, I haven't done that yet. Soft limiter, I've not used that. Edit, I've not used that, I'm afraid I can't cover these. Save changes, so if we made any changes to this sample, we'd get the option to rename it and save it to the USB. We can replace the actual sample, which will overwrite it. So we're not gonna look too much into that because again, I've not used those too much. Let's go back out. And that's pretty much it for the track menu of this particular sample. But underneath, as you can see, we get access to the sequence for this particular sample. So let's double tap that. And there you can see that it's showing one bar of our step sequencer for this particular track. So I'm not gonna play back or record, I'm just gonna put some notes in to my step sequencer below the pads, and they're reflected in this screen. We can clear all those triggers. Down here we've got quantize. Now quantize, this is for the sequencer, we can set it to off or we can set it to these different time divisions. Pattern quantize is how the patterns are launched. So when it's set to pattern, it will wait until the current pattern has finished and then it will trigger the next pattern. Bar will play the next pattern after the bar has finished. Beat will do it to beats, okay? So you can quickly flick between your patterns. Steps, I assume, is an even finer increment and then you can just set it to completely off and literally chop between your patterns as quick as you like. I've not used pad sequence start, but I would assume if you set it to on, you can choose a pad. As soon as you press a pad, it will start your sequence. Okay. Um, but up here are the quantization settings for when you input notes into the step sequencer. So I'm gonna turn mine off and go back out. We've got no notes in there, so I'm just gonna put a load of random notes into the sequencer. So down here, in the bottom left, you've got your record button, which is just above your stop button. So I'm gonna arm the record, and I'm gonna press play. Okay, so a load of random notes there. And just press quantize, and there you go. It's shifted those onto the nearest logical steps in the sequence. Let's actually clear those triggers. Now I didn't have a quantization of value set here, so I assume it's just done it to the nearest logical divisions in this sequence. Okay, so I'm gonna set that to quarter notes now. Go back out, and I'm gonna record again. I'm gonna assume that this quantization doesn't correspond to this. This one will just quantize your notes to the nearest logical position in the sequence, whereas this will actually live quantize for you, okay? I hope that makes sense. So I'm gonna clear the triggers, okay. Now this is where you would set up whether your samples play at full or half level. When it's full, the color on your step sequencer for the steps that you put in are the kind of full 
tone of the color of the pad, okay? They correspond to the pad. So my first pad is red, and you can see these are in red, these first eight steps. If I switch that to half now and input notes for the other eight steps, they will be now pink. You can't really see it on the screen. It looks like they're white, but they're actually pink on my sequencer. So that just shows you that they will now play back at half level. So let's take a listen. Okay, so the first eight steps are full level. So just using that is quite interesting in, in itself. Now parameter, I'm not actually sure what that is. I do know that you can press and hold one of your steps in your step sequencer and then adjust the volume, for example. So let's go out to the home page. And as you can see, we've got the volume for this kick drum. Now if I press, uh, I'm just gonna press step three at the moment and adjust that volume. I'm gonna press step five and hold it and adjust that. And I'm gonna press and hold step seven and adjust that. So it doesn't actually show as it's scrolling through the, the changes that I've just put in, but you can hear those changes now. Let's go back to the step sequencer. And there you go. So you can actually set all your notes to be parameter, but it's just set the ones that I've actually chosen there to parameter. I don't know why it's only showing. Um, maybe it's the last one that I press, which was possibly five, but three, five, and seven should all have this P on them. And the rest should either be at half or full. But for some reason, it's not showing that. But then if I actually press on the, the pads, it's changing them all to parameter or param because that's what I've currently selected. Anyway, that's what that does. It allows you to set the behavior of the steps. You can also, let's go back out, in the same way that I parameter lock the volume, you can also parameter lock the pitch. I think that's why they're red. These ones that are blue, that's probably to signify that you can't actually parameter lock those. If I go to the effects, again, yeah, so we can actually adjust the individual step um, parameter amounts for the effects, which is really interesting as well. So we can have the rate of the delay at a different value for each step in our sequence, which can be really interesting for kind of glitchy and experimental stuff. Anyway, let's go back into that sequence. Let's clear all those triggers. Now that's pretty much covered all of those. Now, as you can see, we've only got one bar here. To give us four bars or 64 total steps, we need to go down to the, um, towards the bottom left of the DJS 1000. We need to press and hold shift. And then we need to click our pattern button, which is on the opposite side, on the right, towards the bottom right corner and press pattern. And now you can increase the length of the pattern in the very bottom right hand corner where it says one, two, three, four, and they will light up blue. Okay. And as you can see on the screen here, that's corresponding to those buttons that I'm pressing. And that will give us two, three, four bars. Now to get out of that, you just press pattern again, and then you back into sequencer mode. Down here, we've got re-trigger. So I'm just gonna put in some notes just simple notes. Now I'm actually gonna press shift and press pattern again and reduce my bars because I wanna just stay in one bar for the sake of this tutorial. If I've got four bars, then we're just gonna have to wait a long time before that loops round. Okay, so I'm gonna press and hold my fifth step. Okay, this one, and I'm gonna set the re-trigger to re-trigger twice. There you go, you can hear it. Now it doesn't sound great because it's at quite a high re-trigger speed of 30 second note. So let's change that to... So if I press and hold it, it will show here and update the value. So that's just re-triggering step five. Now I'm gonna do the same for step 13. I'm gonna change that to 16th notes and a re-trigger count of at least four because we've got obviously these beats or these four steps before the end of the sequence. OK, 
okay we can do that for any step we can also offset individual notes so I'm going to offset I'm going to take the re-trigger off of step 5 I'm actually going to take the re-trigger off of all of them otherwise that will start driving everyone mad watching this but if you press and hold the step you can also offset that and you'll notice the arrow will move so it's on step 5 but we're offsetting the position of that so I've actually offset it to step six. So I might as well just put the step on step six and it would be exactly the same. See? Because now step six isn't offset, it's dead on step six. But if I put it on step five and then I press and hold, I can offset it to literally one step away from its base step, if that makes sense. Okay, shift will shift all the notes in your sequence. So if you've got a long sequence of percussion or something, and you wanna just give the sequence a different feel, you can shift that entire track or that entire sample or pad along your sequence, okay? Which is handy. Now you can choose the area to be shifted to just one bar or all, okay? So let's actually increase the bars again by press and hold shift. So if I press and hold shift and press, so if I press and hold shift and press pattern, let's increase our bars to two bars. Okay, I'm going to go into bar two now. Let's blank, put some notes in. Now, if I now shift, that will shift both of the two bars. Okay, so if we look at the first bar, it's on those steps. The second bar is on the same steps. So let's just set the shift area to bar and it should just shift this current bar that I'm in, which is bar two. Yeah, it does. So if we go back to bar one, they're on um, steps one, five, nine, and 13, and now we've shifted bar two, and they're on steps four, eight, 12, and 16. Cool, so I'm gonna clear the triggers. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how the sequencer works for each sample. Okay, we get access to this view for every 16 samples or every or each of the 16 pads that we've got in our project. Now I'm going to go down to the bottom here and talk about these options here. Player one, I think that's where you would set up whether this is the master and you've got another one of these or a to rise or something else linked via the ethernet cable and you choose which is player one and player two. I'm assuming I've not used that. I'm just using this machine on its own. So I'm going to make that assumption there. Now this is where things get interesting click on that and we can see the scenes and the patterns that we're working with. So scenes are essentially project slots that if I was to occupy all my pads with different samples, if I switched to a new scene and then copied this first scene to scene two, so to do that I would select the scene that I'm in, I press copy, select a new scene and paste. Scenes hold your patterns, okay? We've got 16 scenes available and each of those scenes can contain a total of 16 patterns. But scenes are like a top level where you can actually load different samples into the different scenes and it won't actually take those samples and you know make those changes in your other scenes, which is really handy. So as an example, we know that our first scene that I started this video with we've got these two samples here let's press that again to see the scenes if we now go to scene two go back to home so we're now looking at scene two okay we've not actually created a pattern so we're still in scene one but I've selected scene two I need to actually select a pattern for it to now switch so now we're in scene two let's go to home so now I can swap out this sample 
So let's just choose one at random. I'm trying to do what you can do on the NPC Live. You can't actually use this to scroll on the touch screen. You have to use your data wheel. Okay, let's just choose that nasty bass sound. Now we don't have to save or anything. It just automatically loads that into this scene. Let's go back to scene one, okay? And as you can see, we've got that bass sound. Okay, so it hasn't updated that in this scene, which is really good, and that will tell you that you can, you know, load an entire new bank of 16 samples onto your pads per scene. When you switch scenes, it cuts your samples off dead as well. Okay, you don't get anything trailing off as far as I'm aware, unless there's a setting for you to actually kind of make smoother blends between those scenes. But at the moment, it seems like the behavior is, is that they will cut each other off because it's updating obviously all the samples and settings per scene, which would make sense. But if there would be some way to blend that, it'd be quite nice. So you could actually have maybe the effects um, drifting off over the top to make a smoother transition or a scene morph would be amazing. We've only got one pattern in, let's just stay in this. In fact, I'm gonna delete that second scene. So you could just delete it easily from there. So we've just got our one scene now and one pattern. So we can also copy our patterns. Now it's not letting me do it because I don't think there's any notes. Okay, there you go. So you have to actually put a note into the sequencer for that pattern to be activated, so to speak. So now if we press copy, it goes with a, you know, chevrons to show that it's highlighted. That's the pattern you want to copy. You click on a new empty pattern slot and you just press paste. And now we've got that exact same pattern copied onto pattern two. We can also delete the patterns. So copying, pasting and deleting, you know, you can do it to scenes and patterns, but you do have to select whether it's, you know, whichever pattern it is or whichever ever scene it is that you want to copy, paste or delete. As you can see here, we've got scene BPM. This means we can set an individual BPM for each of our scenes. So again, I'm gonna select the scene, press copy, get the chevrons, press scene two, and we're gonna paste that onto there. Now I'm gonna press the scene BPM for scene one, which we're currently in, and we can just use the data wheel to scroll through and choose a completely individual BPM. So let's choose 100 for this. Let's just go back in there. We can clear that. We can press current BPM and it will jump to whatever the current BPM is, but the current BPM is now 100 anyway because we've set that in here. We can cancel or just press OK to get out of there. Okay, so that's the current BPM and that is reflected here and it shows you what the scene BPM is there, right? If we now go to scene two, our current BPM is still 100 because we've not set the scene BPM. So we could increase our BPM if we highlight that. Okay, so we've now we've increased it to 130. Sorry, I've gone back out of there. Okay, so now scene two is 130 and scene one is 100 and it will only jump back to scene one or any other scene if you then press the pattern or whatever pattern you've got uh, loaded into that scene. So that's scenes and patterns, copy, paste and delete and setting the BPM. Okay, so that was in pattern mode. That shows us the patterns and the scenes. If we go to sequence, that will now show us our sequences, okay? So this is showing us our four kick drums that we've got input into the sequencer. As you can see, it's highlighted with a white um, bounding box here. We can copy it to another track or we can copy it to another position in the total 64 bars. Now we've not added additional bars, but if we now paste that, it's pasted the notes, but we don't get access to them. We can paste them all the way along. So now we've got 16 of these kick drums along our four bars, but we now again have to press and hold shift and press pattern to actually open up those additional bars. 
and there you go. So what we can also do is press copy on those selected bars or whichever bar that you've selected. Okay, so we've copied those notes. We could press another pad and it will paste those notes onto another pad or another track, which is really handy. I've pasted them onto track five or pad five, but we've not got a sample in there. But if we did, it would just trigger back whatever sample in the same way that it's triggering those. So that's really handy, a nice little simple sequencer. Um, now I say simple, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I find this machine has got a lot of simplistic features about it, which are really handy, it's really refreshing, and you can actually get a lot of mileage out of it, just in the way that it is set up in this simplistic way, once you get your head around these sequencing features. Just the fact that I can now choose any you know, let's actually go to um, pad 13. I'm gonna put in a load of random notes. We've not obviously got a sample on that. And I can just do the same. I can copy that, select another pad, move this along, paste them to a different position in the sequence. It's really versatile, really simple, but really versatile, and I really like it. We can delete those notes by highlighting them, selecting the pad, delete those, so that's how the sequencer works. As you can see down the bottom here, we can choose what scene we're in. Okay, so we can just jump scenes there and start um, adjusting the scenes. So we're now in scene two, pattern one. So let's make sure we've highlighted my first pad. I'm gonna copy those kicks. I'm gonna go back to my first scene with this knob. And yeah, we get options to paste now. Um, so we can actually copy and paste between scenes, which is really good, and patterns. Okay, we've not got any more patterns than pattern one, okay? So I've not used this, but it says current track, so you're copying and pasting or deleting the current track, but you can actually move that up to all. Okay, so I'm gonna actually put in some notes on a few random pads that have not got any samples loaded. Um, copy, move that along, paste. So yeah, you can actually create a whole bar with all your 16 samples, paste them along, you can paste them to a different scene, to a different pattern, all from all these controls here. So it's really, really handy. And you can actually increase the bar length there of the selection that is. That doesn't actually increase the amount of bars that's currently playing back. You still have to do the press and hold shift pattern and then increase them that way. So we've covered pattern, we've covered the sequencer and track. Let's say um, we've got a nice sequence with this kick drum. We can just copy that kick drum by pressing copy we also get that highlighted now. We can copy that to another pad and it will copy all the notes in the sequence and it will copy that actual sample to another pad. If I press paste, it will just paste it on there. If I now press uh, pad one again and copy and try and paste it on top of that because that's now got the same sample or if it had any other sample, it will say overwrite just to let you know that you've got a sample on there, do you want to actually overwrite it? Because it will overwrite and update all the settings for that track or that pad or that sample, so to speak. You can also copy pads or tracks between scenes. So let's go and choose pad one there, copy. Let's go to scene two. So you can actually copy tracks and samples, one in the same between scenes, which is also very, very convenient for building up sequences very quickly and getting loads of variations and stuff. Now, it says include sequence, so you can deselect that and it won't copy the notes that you've got in your sequence for that particular track or sample or pad. Okay, but I had mine selected so it would have copied over all the sequence data as well. You can also choose whether it's the current track or all. So you could actually copy all, okay? So as you can see, it's when it sets a current, you actually have to select a track and then it lets you copy and then in turn paste. 
but if we set it to all, copy is always highlighted because it's just essentially saying, well, you're, you're asking me to copy everything so you don't have to select it. It will just allow you to copy and then paste to another, there you go, to another scene. So we've got now a third scene that we've copied all that data from, from all those tracks. So before I stop this video, I'm just gonna play you some sections of stuff that I've already got going in this machine up till now. I've had it two days and I've already got a lot of mileage out of this. If I go to project, I'm gonna choose open. So with my data wheel, just scroll down to open and I'm gonna choose USB recent project, which is this Tube Digger 1 project that I've been working on. And it'll give me this warning, any unsaved progress will be lost and playback will stop. I don't wanna save this, so it's just gonna load in over the top. So you might have seen my previous video where I did a little drone jam session. So that's this, so that's scene four. So if I press scene there, and let's go back to, I think it's scene three. Yeah, scene three. So this is some kind of, I don't know, trap kind of EDM thing that I was working on. So I'm just gonna play you this and I'm just gonna flick through the patterns on the fly before I end the video and hopefully that will warm you guys up for the next video where I'm going to cover some more in-depth things about how to use slices and how time stretching behaves and things of that nature. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. I'm just going to play the video out now with this little sequence that I've made. Stay tuned guys. Please like, share and subscribe. Please support me on Patreon if you wish. This is Tube Digger and I'm out.